Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith with the Laboratory for Paleoclimatology at the University of Ottawa and also with the Department of Geography and Environmental uh, Studies, DGES, at Carleton University. So I'm continuing um, a, my, my uh, presentation here on um, global food supplies and in particular on, on um, fish, whether, you know, both, both through catches and aquaculture. And basically the result is that we're really on a knife edge here in terms of the, our ability to feed the growing population. And we're going to, we're heading to a bad place of global food shortages. This is an emergency. This is what the red light symbolizes. So basically, my bad sense of humor, Okay, so I, you may not be able to read this, but I'm continuing on the ecosystem effects. So for aquaculture, um, so aquaculture, pathway of effects. Um, you have the placement and removal of site infrastructure, use of industrial equipment, site and stock management. And then you alter the habitat with your structures. You alter the light, the ability of light to go through the ocean, the noise, the re you release chemicals and litter, especially if you're using antibiotics and things or things to make the fish grow faster and quicker, faster and bigger. Uh, release removal of nutrients, non-cultured organisms. You release removal of fish, release of pathogens. You have monocultures, so they're at risk to pathogens. You change the suspended sediment, change the water flow, the contaminants, the habitat, the primary productivity. You change the oxygen, both at the water column and, and on the seafloor and near the surface. You change the access to habitat migration routes, change the, the substrate, the geochemistry, the food availability, the wild fish populations, and the, the health of the, both the wild fish and the farmed fish. And then, so there's all of these stresses, all of these activities, all of these effects, and these need to be considered in any aquaculture operation that is done properly. There's also lots of conflicts. So the harvest rate. For food security, you want the maximum sustainable. For biodiversity, you want to reduce it. The, uh, the lower trophic levels of the food chain. For food security, you want to fish more. For a healthy ecosystem, you want to fish less at the lower trophic levels. Um, high pro productivity areas, you want to fish more. For biodiversity, you want extra protect protection. For mariculture, you want to change the species and increase the, the harvesting. You want to reduce them for biodiversity. Same with freshwater cultures. And you want to freshwater the use of strains that are bred for aquaculture. You want to increase the catches and you want to reduce them for bio biodiversity. So there's conflicts between food security and biodiversity. Are fisheries and aquaculture really focused on global food security? That's the question. You can look at the equity of distribution of food and economic benefits from fishing and aquaculture. So what we see here is this is the regional picture on consumption. Um, this is kilograms per capita consumption of food. And what you can see is you can see the um, North America is the dotted line here increasing. This is Europe. Um, and you can see Southeast Asia rising rapidly. And then the, the consumption per capita per person is much lower in say Africa and other Asian countries. So if we look at, are the food insecure places fishing for money or food? And what you can see is this is the, um, this is low income food deprived countries, um, food deficient countries, LIFDCs, and developing countries. So the developing countries are the exports are rising and, and they're higher than the imports. For the LIFDCs, um, similar but much lower. If you look at developed countries, 
the imports are much higher than the exports. So if you subtract exports minus imports, then the developing countries, the exports are increasing more and more. So they're fishing for, they're fishing to sell their fish. They're fishing for money. Whereas the developed countries, the exports minus imports is dropping. So they're exporting much less and they're importing much more. So it's a, it's a money thing, it's not a food thing. Um, the food insecure places are fishing to get money to buy food, they're not fishing to, for, to eat, eat as much of that food. So we need to think about these problems in a different way, so in terms of fisheries. So conventional harvesting is like an axe cutting a log. Okay, you choose an economically profitable or culturally preferred species of, of, or stocks of fish, fish ages and sizes that are most attractive to market, and then you fish them as close to the maximum sustainable yield as possible. You know, maybe back off for um, foraging, forage species. And you, there's serious eco ec ecosystem problems from fishing this way. There's a lot of waste, there's a lot of bycatch, there's a lot of impacts on habitat. This creates wealth, but the distribution is not so good. And it also, this is not the way to, this is what we traditionally do and it's not, it's causing huge problems. So the idea of balanced harvesting is if you have a plane peeling layers off the log, all the way along the log, you're not just ch chopping a notch in it. So you fish all species in the system at the same percentage age of their respective productivities. You spread the harvesting in space and across all interacting species and sizes in the area this is considered to have maximum harvest for uh, a regulated degree of perturbation. So you only fish, you don't fish to harm the entire ecosystem, you just fish, you know, take some off the top all the way across the board. So you have less impact or minimal achievable impact on ecosystem structure and function for a given total yield. But this is not the way we do things. So if you look at a graph here, um, this is on a log scale, this is um, small fish, large fish, fish, so this is the size from small to large, and this is the density or the number of fish. So if you do um, this balanced harvesting, the, the dotted line is with no fishing. Um, this is, this is the, the, the dotted line is the uh, distribution of fish size um, that's there, and then when you harvest, you chop a little bit off here and keep the distribution similar. Um, and that's um, balanced harvesting. Um, if you do unregulated unre uh, weekly selective fishing, then you get these kinks and things which are very bad for the population. And this is conventional selective fishing. You know, you aim for a certain type of fish above a certain size, and you have all this bycatch which is killed in the process, and you get all these kinks and things which are very, um, very dangerous, they're very bad for the um, fisheries. So unmanaged subsistence fisheries performed much better, um, which was, um, so this, this type of thing here um, was much better than this, and this is generally, there's no empirical, empirical examples of this strategy, we're just not using this strategy. Um, but balanced harvesting brings new problems. It runs counter to market-based harvesting. It runs counter to many cultures in the world. You know, it allows some take of iconic species that wouldn't be caught otherwise. You don't have productivity estimates for many stocks of what you're getting. Um, you need new technologies to spread the harvesting across um, different regions. And, uh, but these are not harder challenges than what fisheries faced in the 1950s. Okay, so we don't have governance structures to even start this type of dialogue, um, but that's for another talk. So global food security presentations, other presentations that were there, basically the sustainable development goals <coughs> of APEC, end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition. We have 925 million people hungry now, we need 14% more food per decade to break even. But we have global declines in crop production. So from 2005 to 2015, maize down 4%, wheat down 5%. This is per decade. 
because of less rainfall, higher temperature. Um, not good data on rice. Um, it's not just how much decline is occurring, but where they occur. So grains are declining greatest in less food secure areas like Africa, South America, East and South Asia. The forecast for 2050 is with wheat. Irrigation will allow stable yield in North America and Europe, but down 43 to 57% in Central Asia and Southern Asia, down 44 to 97% in Africa, down 43 to 50% in um, Asia. So sorry, this is Central um, America and South America. Livestock, cattle and swine, moderate reduction in temperate, larger reductions in tropics, and poultry, an open question mark. So there's lots of challenges ahead. Greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture and forestry have doubled since 1960. Um, the Green Revolution um, really changed how the benefits of agriculture were distributed. We need to decrease the rate of native ecosystem conversion and land alienation. So the bottom line, 100 million more people are forecast to be undernourished by 2030. This is a huge problem. This is the climate and sustainability risk and readiness matrix. So you're more, you're, the, the, where the readiness is higher down here with electricity, mining, automobiles. When you go up here to food producers, the risk is the highest and the readiness is the lowest. And greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture are going up. So we're heading in the wrong direction. The implications for fish production, um, 90 to 110 million metric tons is a um, more realistic goal. This will require improved management in poor management areas, and some will have to come from freshwater aquaculture. Conventional fisheries, cannot meet the needs. So this is what we have for, this This is a poorly managed coastal fishery. The fish available from stocks decreasing, fish needed by a growing population going up, a huge gap to be, there's a huge gap between these. This is a well-managed coastal fisheries, um, a smaller gap, but still a gap nonetheless. So, in order to, um, so greenhouse gas emissions um, with, there, there's always a competition on coast now between wind farms, tidal wave energy facilities, and aquaculture. Um, hydropower growth will stagnate and possibly reverse as the water needed for irrigation. Um, as there's more water needed for irrigation, this would compete with freshwater fisheries. So food security, um, we're going to need more mariculture, um, expand the fisheries, maybe by balanced harvesting, targeting lower trophic levels, um, fewer, smaller, no-take marine protected areas. Um, we need to do something about global population. Food security, conservation of biodiversity, and sustainable of fisheries. We need those to succeed. They have to be coherent across institutions. So these are huge challenges to society. So here we have a Rubik's Cube. We have the environment, we have resources and fisheries, um, and the, um, the, the different sectors, subsectors of fisheries, conventional approach, tactical, operational, short-term method, we need to fit these things all together if we are to have any success. If one of these parts fails, then the whole thing uh, comes down. So there's some government institutions that are, so there's, here's sort of a development scenario of in order to have responsible fisheries and so on, there's a lot of different government groups that have to work together. I, I'll stay away from those acronyms. I don't remember them all myself. But basically we have biodiversity and we have fisheries systems conditions. And in order to go, we want to be up here. We want to be sustainable. If we treat nature first, it's socially unstable. If we treat people first, then it's ecologically unstable. You want to be somewhere in the middle. And again, another uh, 
Rubik's Cube type thing with